Inflation hammers Biden again. PayPal cracks down and backs off. And did Tulsi leave the Democrats? Or the Democrats leave Tulsi? We'll discuss all this and more on this edition of The Editors. I'm Rich Lowry, and I'm joined as always by the right Honorable Charles C.W. Cook, Madeline Maddie Kearns, and the notorious M.B.D. Michael Brendan Doherty. You are, of course, listening to a National Review podcast. Our sponsors this episode are NetChoice, ExpressVPN, and Acton Unwind. More about all of them in due course. If for some reason you're not already following us on streaming service, you can find us everywhere from Spotify to iTunes. If you like what you hear here, please consider giving us a glowing five-star review on iTunes. If you don't like what you hear here, please forget I said Anything. So before we get into it in earnest, a message from our first sponsor today, NetChoice, which is a trade organization dedicated to free expression and free enterprise online. Being a parent is never easy, especially during the technology age. With more kids going online at younger ages, parents want to keep their kids safe and secure on the Internet. To protect their kids, parents use services they trust, including the world-leading privacy and security measures which are currently offered by tech services like app stores, but a new bill in Congress called the Open App Markets Act would disable many of these services by forcing companies to share their privacy and security features with third parties. If passed, the nonprofit Stop Child Predators warns that the Open App Markets Act will risk child safety online by breaking down these digital guardrails that protect children. It shouldn't be harder for parents to keep their kids safe online. Tell your senator to say no. To the Open App Markets Act. To learn more, please visit netchoice.org. Again, it's netchoice.org. Check it out. So, MBD, we had yet another bad inflation number this week. Just part of the trend we've talked about a little bit on prior episodes of inflation, the economy, really just overwhelming the issue that Democrats want to focus on, which is abortion. That seemed like in August they're making pretty good headway on that. And you still have a lot of Democrats who are are trailing or in trouble hoping that uh, abortion, abortion will make the difference for them and almost running exclusively on it. Mandela Barnes up in Wisconsin is um, uh, desperately uh, running on abortion now. Stacey Abrams has been doing it for weeks now. She's pretty far behind Brian Kemp. I think there's a poll this week that had her down 10, amazingly enough. And Fetterman, although he's still leading, I think in every single poll that that we've seen in Pennsylvania, he's turning to it as well and has clearly been hurt on the issue of crime. What do you make of it? Well, I mean... It's the truism in American life that pocketbook issues matter. And the the way inflation has hit Americans, it's hit them in two spots most um, especially. That's food and fuel. Uh, so basically, you know, your middle class lifestyle, you mm-hmm. know, uh, you get into the car once a week, twice a week, go to a grocery store, load up and bring it home. And you probably fill your gas tank up once or twice a week, maybe more. I I mean, you can't not notice. (laughs) You you, you can't not notice that food is up. I think uh, if you eat at home, it's 13% more than it was last year. Uh, That's an enormous rise. Um, You know, and of course, gas prices are a perennial topic, right? Like, And they're almost like a barometer of how you feel about the country. Like everyone felt great about how America was doing in 1999 when you could get gas for like 94 cents a gallon. Uh, When I was 17, Uh, it had come down over that decade from, you know, a dollar and a quarter to less than a dollar, at least in my area. And, you know, once it's getting up to near five dollars, you You feel horrible about filling up your tank, even if you're even if you're relatively well off, uh, you feel like you're getting a raw deal. So, um, you know, this is just, you know, Democrats will never live in a world where people are looking to get an abortion twice a week. They are looking to fill up their gas Mm -hmm. tank, though. Right. So it's just uh, this is going to be a more salient issue. And um, and Republicans are right to run on it. Uh, because we do have good evidence that the last rounds of coronavirus spending authorized by the Biden administration with this Congress were a major part of it. Now, 
it, it, it's not all his fault. I mean, this this is this all goes back to the Trump era. It goes back to the pandemic. It goes back to the global slowdown in production that happened during 2020 and 2021. But Republicans would be fools not to make this the major issue, that and crime, because everywhere feels less safe, too. Yeah. So, Maddie, none of us are economic uh, experts, but it's clear that it, whatever's been driving inflation at any given moment might give way a, a little bit. You know, it was used car prices. I think used car prices have now collapsed. Then it was gas prices and gas prices went down for a while, although now they're coming back up. But now it's food. So it's always something. The consistent has been that there has been an inflation that is at a high enough level that it materially affects the financial well-being of average Americans. I mean, it's just eroding their wages every day. And what I feared in August, cultural issues are very powerful. They're totally legitimate. They mean a lot to people. And one problem Democrats have had over the years on cultural issues is that they wouldn't moderate on cultural issues. They'd always try to say, well, look at this other issue over here. This is something you should care about. And I worried that maybe Republicans, by trying to evade abortion, as many of them uh, did, you know, just trying to duck and cover, it's like we're, we're really focused on inflation. We're repeating that kind of failed play playbook. But it turns out inflation is just it's just much more of an overwhelming issue, as Michael alludes to, than abortion. Yeah, exactly. And on Thursday, we had this September report, which um, showed a rebound in prices from July and August. And I think one of the biggest problems Biden has is that he's overpromised. So he said, I think Jim noted on the corner he, or on the morning show, he said three times now that the problem would go away. He said that in 2021, 20, he said it in December um, as well, and then in, in, in February. And obviously that hasn't happened. So I think people are feeling a sense of frustration. They're thinking, we've been dealing with this problem for months now. You said it was going to get better. It hasn't gotten better. Um, and as you say, this ranks very high on people's priority list. I think there was a new poll out from the Washington Post, and it, it found, uh, unsurprisingly, that the two top issues uh, among registered voters are the economy and inflation. And clear majorities trust Republicans more than Democrats on those issues. So while Democrats would love to make the election about Trump and abortion, they are struggling to do that because Trump and abortion are not issues that affect people on the day to day basis in exactly the same way as as these economic issues do. So, Charlie, let's say you're Joe Biden. You're, you're president of the United States and you, you come in and, and you make the initial mistake you know, of the COVID relief bill that we we didn't need. And even if you're going to pass it, despite the fact we don't need it, was was at a, a, a massive scale. And you got this, you know, and you have other factors playing into the inflation that aren't directly your, your responsibility. It's a tendency to, of every president to say things are going to get better. You know, you never want to say, oh, man, we're just screwed. There's nothing to do about this. It's a persistent problem. It's not going away. So you're going to do what um, um, Jim pointed out that, Biden has done repeatedly. You know, we turned the corner. You know, it's getting better. Um, plus, you're a progressive who, you know, your agenda is based on spending more. What what would you do? What what uh, how could Biden have handed handled this better politically and substantively besides just doing a U turn on most of his priorities? He could be a completely different person with a completely different set of political agenda items. As you say, the problem is progressivism, because progressivism requires spending. And progressives have convinced themselves that there is such a structural disadvantage in the Electoral College and the Senate that this is their moment, and they're going to try and get as much through as they can without worrying about the consequences. There is a way for Biden to have addressed this and done things that would not have been inconsistent with progressivism, but would have been inconsistent with what he had promised when running for president. He could have used fiscal policy, had his party gone along with him, to raise taxes and thereby reduce demand. And this is the great irony here, I think, that the Democratic Party over time, and this is a testament to the success of Republicans in this area, has raised and raised and raised the 
rhetorical line at which somebody becomes rich. So, you know, we had $300,000 under Hillary Clinton and $400,000 now under Biden. Now, it's dishonest in the way it's calibrated, and he hasn't stuck to it in a technical sense. But broadly speaking, the Democratic Party institutionally has decided that the people who are rich earn more than $400,000. But that, in turn, has limited the options that the legislature has to try and fight inflation. One option is to stop spending all the time. The other option is to take money out of the pockets of people with disposable income. If you're going to do that, you can't tax the poor because poor people have to buy groceries irrespective of their income level. And you can't tax the rich because the rich have so much money that the demand is relatively inelastic. So you have to tax people who earn between about $75,000 and $350,000, $400,000. That would help fight inflation. Of course, what Biden has done is the opposite. They've spent a whole bunch of money. They've excluded all of those people from tax increases. They have sent them large checks or subsidized their spending. With the Student Loan Act, which is unconstitutional, they have put more money, at least they will if it stands, into the pockets of people who are already better off than the average person and thereby made inflation marginally worse. But I, I've said this over and over again, and I'm sure our listeners are bored of it, but so be it. I still don't understand how Biden hasn't grasped that this is the issue that's killing his presidency. Still, e even yesterday, he didn't get it. It's not going away. The consequences of it and the mitigating behavior, which will be a, an increase in interest rates and a recession, are going to be not only deeply unpopular, but are going to be what people talk about. They're not going to talk about other things. At least they're not going to talk about them more than inflation. Inflation is the issue of our time. People talk about it casually. Talk about it at the supermarket checkout. They talk about it when milling around and making small talk at children's birthday parties. I don't mean people are political in the way you would see on a show like The West Wing. I just mean it is in the air. They make jokes about it, about the increase in prices. They gripe about the cost of milk and gas. They talk about how difficult it is to buy a new car or how they're priced out of the housing market or how the increase in interest rates is affecting their business or their prospective mortgage. You can't get away from it. And Biden just seems to want to throw it to one side and say, yes, yes, yes. Well, it's not very much. Well, it's transient. Well, it's going to go away. Well, it's getting better. Or his latest one, did you know that Republicans voted against the Inflation Reduction Act, which, of course, as everybody knows, did not do anything to reduce inflation and will not do anything to reduce inflation and is a perfect illustration of his not taking this seriously because people who actually cared about this issue instead of wanted talking points on this issue would have invited Congress, pushed Congress, cajoled Congress to pass a bill that actually did something to address inflation or not to pass a bill at all and just left it to the Federal Reserve. I just want to pick up on one thing to finish off my answer here that, that you said, and that is that presidents always like to say things are getting better. I think that as a general rule, that is true, but it's not always true. Actually, some of the leaders that we regard as being within the pantheon, the people we point to, the people we buy biographies of and people put up in their offices, often made their names telling people that it would get better, but only if we went through a difficult time. Mm -hmm. Winston Churchill did not come in in 1940 and say everything's going to be fine. In fact, in his first speech to the House of Commons, he did precisely the opposite. Ronald Reagan... Mr. Sunny Optimism did not say in 1980, 81, 82, oh, this is a temporary glitch. Don't worry, everything's getting better. 
Yeah, F- don't FDR. you feel good? I, I guess I would, the way I would couch it more precisely, though, is if there's economic problems on your watch, it's very rare for someone to say, "Oh yeah, this is big trouble." Right? It's I one think thing that's to kind of come and inherit inherit it and say, "Oh, th- this is going to be really painful to to work out this problem caused by my predecessor." Well, it's I think that's true, Rich, to... but but I also think that, that that, in a sense, lets Biden off the hook for his early behavior because he had a perfect opportunity, whether it would have been fair or not, to have come in and said, look, my predecessor has ruined the country. It's not as if he wouldn't have found that line being echoed in every press outlet mm-hmm. ad nauseam. He ruined the country because he didn't take COVID seriously. He ruined the country by spending too much. He ruined the country by giving tax cuts to the rich that are, whatever you want to say and then you say i'm not going to do that i'm worried about working people this is the issue but it's going to be tough for a while he didn't he just yeah. he's incapable well they, well, they missed i mean they seriously. also just missed missed inflation they they just didn't think it was going to be a problem and you're right i mean there's no he hasn't had any problem blaming trump for anything else at the end of his nuclear armageddon statement at that New York City fundraiser, there's a line, you know, oh, we're going to have nuclear Armageddon, maybe this is the worst crisis since the, the Cuban Missile Crisis. Oh, and by the way, I just didn't realize how badly my predecessor messed up our foreign policy. <laughs> so he obviously doesn't have any problem blaming blaming Trump. MBD, let me go to you, widen it out, um, uh, politics more generally here. So obviously a theme of the midterms has been poor candidate choice by Republicans. We've seen that play out with Herschel Walker. Indications are that his standing in the polls hasn't really budged. You know, he, he's probably a tick or two behind Warnock, um, but he, he might be through the worst of it. And there, there's still a pretty good chance there that Kemp is going to get him over the top. Then you have Blake Masters, who people don't totally discount, but is clearly a step behind Mark Kelly, at the same time, you know, Carrie Lake, this really out there stop the steal candidate is ahead in the gubernatorial race in Arizona. So that really underlines Masters weakness. You know, if if she if she's quite probably going to win and he's going to lose, what what does that say about him? But then, you know, you, you have these uh, Democratic choices that haven't been great either. And Exhibit A is Mandela Barnes up there in Wisconsin. A, you know, a would-be member of a squad, a uh, young African American with woke uh, attitudes um, and sensibilities, said the most sweepingly, you know, anti-police, uh, anti-American things in the wake of the George Floyd killing. Clearly, was in favor of defunding the police, although he never actually said. Um, those couple of words, but it's clear that he was sympathetic to it, and it's basically what he wanted to to do. And it's just been getting killed on it, just killed on it. And they, they cleared the field for this guy. It's it's not as though he won a contested primary. As soon as he got in, three or four candidates or whoever, uh, however many there were, just got out. And I don't know how much better than they would, would have been, whether they would have been any better, but that's not a great choice. Fetterman too, although he's uh, ahead, you know, he's, he's a, a classic <laughs> case of they, they think if you, you know, if you're big and you wear hoodies and have tattoos, you must have, you know, working class appeal beyond the, the Democratic base, even if every single one of your policy positions is indistinguishable from someone like Mandela Barnes. Yeah, I mean, on Fetterman, you know, it's the funniest joke because he's a Harvard grad who lived with his parents into his 40s and his top issue seems to be deincarceration. I mean, this is like the least working class mm-hmm. uh, background and you could get. Um, but, uh, you know, one of the things I'm, I've been taking away just like looking across the field is that um, it matters if you take something if if you have a profile outside of politics before you enter it and Carrie Lake and Herschel Walker, right. People, when they were, when they won their primaries, people thought, Oh, this is horrible. These are the Trumpiest. These are the craziest people around. They have no shot. Whereas like Blake masters, you know, he was Trumpy in the sense of, he seemed to endorse a kind of nationalist agenda items but he was a little bit of a cipher. He was coming out of Silicon Valley. No one knew who he was in Arizona. 
Uh, but it turns out like the crazy people are winning because Carrie Lake is telegenic. She's mm-hmm. sharp on the camera. Yeah. Herschel Walker has a kind of established record of a comp of high, a high level of accomplishment in football. Um, <laughs> what? I, I just I was wondering what what the accomplishment was going to be, and then it was. Like, yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. Which everyone I mean, looks at looks for in their senators. I mean, people used to play up Jack Kemp's football record. That's I mean, true. That's come true. on, yeah. Yeah. this is not. Uh, come on, like this is not. <laughs> this is not new. You know, uh, I'm sorry, it's not new. Um, so I, I think maybe we have a tendency because of what we do, and and maybe our audience too, to overrate ideology and underrate mm-hmm. just right. like what yeah. does what does the personality come across yeah. like on television? Yeah. Um, so. It's a, it's a point well taken. I haven't heard anyone qu- quite express it that way. Candidate quality matters, even if you're a stop the steal candidate, right? So there, there's a big difference between Kerry Lake and Doug Masterino. And so Masterino's ahead by 10 and she's ahead by two or three. Right. Th- did I say ahead? Um, Masterino's behind. By Masterino's it. behind. So Charlie, uh, last thing here. So my schematic now way of looking at the, the Senate race is Republicans win Pennsylvania, they win the Senate. I think that's probably right. I think they're probably going to win Pennsylvania as well. As I said last time, I think Oz has become the establishment candidate, the default candidate, the safe mm-hmm. candidate. I don't know to what extent we want to go into the absurd gaslighting we've seen around John Fetterman. Oh yeah, so let's 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 actually discuss that a little bit. So you have an NBC reporter, MSNBC reporter, doing an interview with him, where. He still has problems with uh, auditory processing, so there's a laptop set up so her questions can be transcribed, <clears throat> closed captioned in, in real time. And his, his answers, you know, he messed up a, a few words. It wasn't, it didn't sound terrible, but then she says in a subsequent interview, when they're just doing the polite chit-chat before they sat down and before he had the closed captioning, it was clear he had, he had no idea what she was saying. And then then you have various other reporters saying, oh my gosh, how could she have done this? This is really a terrible thing that that she's she's done. And clearly they're you know trying to hide the ball on his uh, about his condition. And this this would not uh, there would not be a similar protectiveness, to say the least, if you're a Republican. Well and we don't need to hypothesize because we watched what happened with Mark Kirk in twenty fifteen. He was an incumbent Republican senator in Illinois, one in the Tea Party wave of twenty ten. And he had a stroke. And that was terrible. But it was also a fair game because strokes affect your brain. And you don't need to take my word for it. You can just look at the Chicago Tribune, which explicitly said that it was declining to endorse him for re-election because of the stroke. No, I don't think that was a problem. I don't think many others thought it was a problem. There was a whole piece in The Atlantic about it that didn't seem to think it was a problem and that quoted people close to him saying it wasn't a problem, that it was incumbent upon Mark Kirk to calm nerves about his condition. The only people in this Atlantic piece who say this is a little beyond the pale, it pointedly notes are Republican partisans who don't know the guy. And that's what we're seeing here. Now, I'm a critic of diagnosing people from afar. I hate this. We saw this with Trump. We've seen this with Biden to some extent. We're not talking here about remote diagnoses or guesswork. John Fetterman's stroke is a matter of public record. He's acknowledged it. And although the exact words haven't been used, his campaign and his defenders have essentially conceded that he has auditory aphasia, which they're downplaying. Now, there's a separate question from what he has, and that is whether it matters. And I think decent people can disagree on that. But we shouldn't ignore what has happened to him. John Fetterman had a terrible stroke. By all accounts, He didn't help himself in the years preceding that stroke because he was warned by his doctors. He was prescribed medicine and he declined to take it. I hope for his sake and his family's sake that he is now being more rigorous. But he had a stroke nevertheless. And 
it has incapacitated him, at least temporarily. Yesterday, across the left, we saw pieces comparing the consequences of this stroke to physical disability, to people who wear glasses, to people who struggle with hearing, to people in wheelchairs, to Tammy Duckworth, who lost her legs fighting in Iraq. And by the way, who was in the Senate because Mark Kirk was deemed unacceptable after his stroke. But this is a an insufficient way of describing what has happened, at least temporarily, to John Fetterman. Auditory aphasia is, in a technical sense, a sensory issue. But it's impossible to separate the sensory issue from the cognitive issue because the condition is one in which while you physically hear the words that are being spoken to you, you don't process them properly. Your brain doesn't map them to meaning. It doesn't recognize them within its cache of linguistic cues. If John Fetterman had full aphasia in both directions, he would, in a sense, be talking gibberish. He may not even know that. Some people who have full aphasia have whole conversations in gibberish. They can't take in what's being said to them, and they speak in word salad without others knowing what they're saying as well. That's not what's happened to him, and it doesn't seem to have affected his ability to read, which is another thing that can happen. And so he's substituted auditory stimuli for visual stimuli, and he can recognize those words, map them to meaning. And although it's limited in scope, he can respond. But that is a real condition. Nobody thinks that is a minor condition. It's not sensory in the sense that somebody who stood too close to an explosion has a sensory problem, that they don't hear the words. It's not sensory in the sense that somebody who is born deaf has a sensory issue or who's born blind. This is a cognitive processing issue. It's not necessarily permanent, although very often people who have had strokes will find that as they grow tired, these symptoms come back, and it should be discussed. And I think the attempt to downplay this, to mislead by insisting that it's purely sensory, and to argue in some cases indignantly that merely to bring it up is ableist, that to ask whether it would affect the day-to-day -day work of a senator, which of course it would, is to propose that people who have disabilities should not be elected to Congress. It is is disingenuous and does a great disservice to the, the electoral process and won't work because people are going to talk about this whether the press likes it or not. And probably they're going to talk about this more than they would have now that the number of headlines around it has mm -hmm. exceeded all expectations because this poor journalist who seems to have done her job right. uh, has been lambasted um for doing so yeah on the other side of the ledger by the way by all accounts oz is is actually doing the work and has a has a pretty good campaign team so mbd will go to the punditry question at the end of the night or a couple months uh you know a month or so whatever whatever uh whatever, <laughs> whatever you'd have a potential georgia runoff republicans will have how many senate seats uh, 52. 52. Maddie, again, no pressure. We're just writing it down and keeping track, and we'll throw this back <laughs> to you. After well, I, I first want to just point out that I um, I predicted that the Herschel Walker abor abortion story wouldn't make much of a difference, and I guess there I was right go. about that. So. <laughs> there you go. That's the important thing, to remember <laughs> the things that you're right about and remind everyone else. Like the yes. 2020 election. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, I'm going to assume safety in numbers and, and give an identical answer to Michael 52. Wow. All right. So we got <laughs> optimistic. Everyone is assuming Republicans win Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Georgia, and Nevada. I assume that that's how you get to 52. Charlie? I'm 51. Yeah, I'm still 51. I don't discount 52, but uh, I think one of those seats will be left behind. Uh, but it'll be 51, and that will be enough with that. 
Let's go uh, to Charlie for um, a read about ExpressVPN. Absolutely, which I use all the time in my own life. In fact, all my devices in my house have ExpressVPN installed on them and most of the time have it switched on so that my ISP and my phone provider can't collect data on me and find out what I'm doing all the time and target ads and sell it to others and generally spy on me. Verizon, by the way, has admitted to that. This isn't a conspiracy theory. This is how many businesses make money. Well, not out of me. Now, they say that they do this so they can better understand my interests, which is a euphemism for target advertising, of course. But it's not in my interest for them to do that. So I use ExpressVPN, and I make sure that I have created a tunnel between my house and wherever the data center I'm connected to is, which cannot be intercepted or watched. So they can't see what sites I've visited. They can't see what I've been up to. And they can't increase their paychecks at the expense of my privacy. Now, how does this work? Pretty simply, ExpressVPN is an app you install on your devices, and it prevents your phone carrier or ISP from being able to see the sites you visit and sell it off. And all you have to do is install it and then tap one button. And if you do, all your network is encrypted. It's rerouted through ExpressVPN secure servers for ultimate privacy. They're very fast. So if you have really good internet connection at home and you're worried that this will take down the average speed, it does not. It doesn't just shield your web browsing. Uh, it protects all of your network data so you can stay private within the apps you use as well. And whether you're on an iPhone or Android or a tablet, ExpressVPN will work exactly the same. And the best part is that you only need one subscription for up to five devices at the same time. So you can put it on all of your computers and phones and tablets and give it to your family as well. If you want to get ExpressVPN, all you need to do is go to expressvpn.com forward slash editors, and you'll get three months extra free. That's ExpressVPN, which is E-X-P-R-E-S-S-V-P-N.com slash editors. Thank you so much, Charlie. Everyone, please check it out. So, Maddie, we had a controversy involving PayPal which was considering or on the verge of issuing, I guess it's a matter of dispute, a policy that would have fined users $2,500 if they had an uh, account or raising, uh, I guess if they just had an account, right? And were guilty of spreading misinformation, which raises the question, why is PayPal going to be the misinformation Police, how are they going to make these decisions? What business is it of PayPal to begin with? What people's uh, opinions are and views are? And then PayPal came out and said, you know what? This was a, a big mistake. This never should have been released. We are not intending to do this at all. Nothing to see here. Please move on. Are you moving on, Maddie Currents? Yeah. Um... Well, I, I suppose ultimately, yes, I'm moving on, but it's uh, not not without some points to be made here because basically this is just an example of how corporate wokeness is really just interested in virtue signaling. And the moment there's any backlash, they completely change their policy. So this is not about principles. This is about doing the fashionable thing. Um, and this is just an example of that. So the, the fact that they are saying that they... Um, that this was this misinformation policy was misinformation <laughs> essentially that's what they're saying mm -hmm. um they they released this by mistake it's just not believable it's not believable not least because they previously shut down um an account by uh gays against groomers uh which is uh, the a part of this splintering of the lgb and and, and the t um and the, what's been going on in schools and i, I think what happens is that the, the people making these decisions are uh, completely ignorant about how controversial these things are, how most ordinary people feel about these things. Um, and when they're confronted with that, 
it in, in in an effort to try and control speech, um, they completely abandon it, and so it does speak to the the need to to hold these uh, these corporations to account. And um, there, there's various ways you could do that. You could pass laws that that, that require them to do that, um, or you can just make a big fuss on Twitter, which is what happened on this instance. So, so is this people so gays against groomers? So, do they are they using PayPal for people to pay them for stuff? Or so, if if you're just using PayPal, you know, I'm using PayPal to buy old baseball cards or something, and they don't like my views, they they'd come in and ding me. Or how would this have have worked? Yeah, so I think they were using um, the the payment platform and uh, and also the like. The subsidiary Venmo, um, and I, I, I don't know. I, I imagine they've got like fundraisers as part of of what they do. Um, but they they close these down on on the basis of ideology. Uh, it violated their hate policy apparently, um, which is totally political and transparently so. So, Michael, you must be delighted that uh, yet another sign of the dystopia you fear and expect is indeed. On its way. <laughs> well, listen, this has been coming for a long time. Um, I remember years ago, maybe almost a decade ago, I sat at a, a little dinner, uh, kind of a left wing dinner that I, I was invited to almost by accident. But um, and I listened to an activist working with Color of Change talk about their campaign to get credit card companies to stop working with white supremacists. And it was very obvious that they were going to expand from there to either expand the definition of white supremacy to include more and more um, right-leaning types, regardless of their views on race, or that they would just use the tactic more generally against the right. Um, And there's nothing in the law necessarily to stop them. So this has been coming. I mean, we saw... um, you know, similar things happen to kind of anti-mass immigration activists in Europe, uh, you know, four or five summers ago. Um, they started losing their their right to travel. Uh, governments revoked that. And then uh, credit card companies would s- just steal their bank accounts, essentially, using the legalese that you sign up for when you originally apply for a bank account. Um so yeah, this is this has been coming for a while, but it is something that we can stop with legislation, uh, and probably ought to. So Charlie, what do you think of that? I agree with Michael. Dramatic hooray. silence. Hooray! <laughs> no, hooray! I think. No, I do, and I'll, I'll tell you why. Because there is a profound difference in the way that these institutions are established and regulated, uh, and the way that. The tech companies that Michael and I argue about are established and regulated. As a rule, I don't like the idea of government telling businesses which customers they must accept and which they must reject. But there are certain exceptions to that that convince me. One is natural monopolies, the water lines or even ISPs come from the the street into your house. And the other is extremely tightly regulated businesses that require a government charter in the first instance. Now, the great beauty of the internet, and this is still true, and the fact that consumers have chosen to centralize their activity does not change this. Great beauty of the internet is that anyone can start a business. The barriers to entry are extremely low. There is enormous competition on the internet and that competition comes and goes pretty quickly however it might seem if i tomorrow decided to start a new social network or shopping website i can do it i could have it up in 20 minutes in fact if i wanted to start a bank that's a very very different question I would go through months, maybe years of regulation. I would be watched extremely closely. I would have to agree to all sorts of legislative 
initiatives. And I would need, if I were a, a major player, a, a charter. I, I would need permission. I think when that's the case, you have a different relationship with the general public. I think if the federal government is accepting you within the market and giving you access to benefits that the average business does not have, that Google certainly doesn't have, for example, uh, plugging you in to the, I don't want to say nationalized, but government-run banking system the Federal Reserve represents, then you are not in the same category as a, a Facebook or a Twitter or a Microsoft or an Apple. And you know, the idea that these institutions can just pick and choose their customers in the same way as a sandwich shop or a Twitter, to, to me, is ridiculous, um, especially given how interwoven they are with the rest of our economic activity. So I, I think this is a, uh, a a much more straightforward issue. I think there are uh, fewer First Amendment concerns. And I think we're talking about a set of regulatory presumptions that already exist, but just haven't been extended in this particular way uh, to uh, banking institutions and should be. Um, that aside... The idea that a bank can take your money and either steal it or put it in some form of escrow because it doesn't like your opinions, I think is dangerous. Mm -hmm. Now, there would, of course, need to be some provision within any law for illegal activity. If the uh, security team at PayPal had reason to believe, and I'd want some due process protections here, but if if the security team at PayPal had reason to believe that the money in question was going to be used to, say, stage an Oklahoma City bombing or you know mm. a, a terrorist action, then yeah, uh, like any other banking transaction, it could be frozen under what I would hope would be a, a tightly written set of laws. But that sort of circumstance is not subjective. It's important to determine whether or not it's true. And that's where the due process comes in. But there's no uh, sort of transient or, or fashion uh, side to that question. Whereas what we're talking about here is politics. You know, you, you would not of course, um, have seen the same decisions being made by banks in 1950 as they are now, based on one's political uh, activity. Whereas a, a bank that got a tip in 1950 that the money in a particular account was going to be used to blow up a skyscraper w would, of course, have frozen it. Mm -hmm. So I I think this is... Uh, this is an agenda item or should be an agenda item for the Republican um, Party. And I also think it will be quite difficult, if they even want to, for progressives to oppose. Because one of the things progressives talk about increasingly that conservatives aren't especially interested in is the unbanked. This is a big issue for Bernie Sanders. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez talks about it a lot. I think it's much more complicated than they make it seem. But the argument is that there are millions of Americans who are unbanked. They don't have access to a bank. And the argument is that if they don't have access to the bank, then they are essentially cut off from much of the modern economy. And this is a real problem. And the solution that Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and Bernie Sanders forward is that the post office should start banking, which for other reasons I won't get into, I don't think is a good idea. But it is true that if you are uh, without access to a bank, there are certain things that you just can't do. And, um, you know, that's true uh, in this circumstance as well. I don't want to see people who have unpleasant or unpopular or marginal political opinions being forcibly unbanked. And I think it's within the remit of the federal government to say, if we give you, in the name of the federal government, uh, if we give you this uh, 
this charter. And if we give you access to the various federal you know, deposit insurance, for example, programs that have been passed in everyone's name, then you have a responsibility not to discriminate against people on the basis of their descent from political orthodoxy. So, can, can, can I can I enter in yeah. like a slightly more populist tone to this too after after Charles's Char- 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 Charlie agree but not quite enough. Well, no, but no, I thought I thought that was I thought he I thought, I thought he, we were doing so well, Michael. No, no, we, we are we are doing we are doing so He's well. Just going to keep pulling you right, Charlie. He laid it he laid it out. No, <laughs> he laid it out right. Not gonna stop. He he laid it out masterly, uh, and and I appreciate that. But like, there is also just something so galling about J.P. Morgan Chase dropping like Kanye West over his political views just a few years after J.P. Morgan Chase helped itself to $12 billion of bailout from all taxpayers, including Kanye West. Uh, you know, like it does put you in a Jeffersonian mind, right? Like, which you know, like when he said, everything predicted by the enemies of banks is beginning, in the beginning is now coming to pass. Like th- this... It, this is wicked. Like, why wouldn't you, if you care about fairness or decency, private property, like, why wouldn't you just try to arrest Jamie Dimon right now? I mean, like, I, this so, guy got $12 billion of bailouts and he can't bank with Kanye West. I don't so care what, let me, let me get, how uh, crazy get Kanye West is. Let me get Maddie in again, again, real quick before we leave this one. So, Maddie, we were talking before we started recording on the theme here of, of banks. Charlie was mentioning that he saw on Twitter and kind of had to rub his eyes. He couldn't believe it, thought it might be a, a hoax. Wells Fargo promoting some video about, uh, forgive me if I have a few of the details wrong here, about gay, gay twins, right? Finding out they're they are gay. And why would Wells Fargo, what business at all does it have promoting this sort of material? You'd expect banks just to be boringly down the middle and totally mainstream do they think this is the mainstream do they they think this is just this is fashionable and it's just what what you need to be if you're you're a big with it player what's going on in your view i think they're just completely out of touch with how most people see these issues and they're out of touch in part because self-censorship around these issues now is just common practice so they they can put up these advertisements that a lot of people find offensive or annoying um, because, as you say, it has absolutely nothing to do with banking. Can we just go and get our money out without having some of these politics shoved in our face? But they, they, they're they they're not hearing those complaints a lot of the time. Um, and so they, it gives them the sense that, that this is what people want to hear, that this is something that um, everyone's on, on board with. Obviously, that's not true. I think uh, a related example of this is the the box office flop for the gay romantic comedy Bros, and the the the, the reality is that not very many people want to see um, promiscuous gay lifestyles in in, in a romanticized light. And I'm, I'm just that's just clearly true because people didn't want to go see that. Now, people don't want to go see that because most people are. Um, are interested in, well, most people are straight and most people are interested in uh, forging straight unions. And um, women like romantic comedies because they like seeing men fall in love with women. (laughs) That's what they want to see. They don't want to see uh, just gay, gay lifestyles and promiscuous lifestyles. And I think there's just there's a disconnect between how most people feel about these issues, which is live and let live, absolutely fine for people to make their own choices, but just don't shove it in in my face. And how these corporations, these banks, uh, think that the political temperature actually is on these things. So MBD, I'm asking the wrong person, but I'm going to go to you, to you on this first for an MBD dystopia meter. From zero to 10, zero MBD is just w- w- way too dire and alarmist. N- none of the things he fears are, are going to happen. To 10, we will have a, a corporatist woke dystopia that will uh, significantly in- impinge on people's freedoms in America. Where are you, zero to 10? Uh, I mean, like a seven or, you know, like I think National Review plus people should invest in, uh, you know, 
hard currency that they could forward to us uh, <laughs> by pigeon or falcon uh, in the future uh, to keep their subscriptions going. Well, you know, we'll see. Uh, I'm worried because I just when when you look at the opinions of um, people that are graduating out of top American schools and going into top American corporate positions, they are against free speech. They are overwhelmingly uh, in for social justice. And the people that are critics of this uh, ideology are on the outside of these institutions. Charlie Cook? Well, I think it's coming. I, I do think this is an issue. I think in the long run, it's fixable, though, because I think there are some elements that will require intervention from Congress. Banking, as I say, is one of them. The more involved in the industry the government is to begin with, the more mm -hmm. authority it has to set the rules. And I think, the although I'm profoundly against government getting involved with sort of websites, I think the backbone infrastructure of the internet, the trunk lines and the ISPs could also be regulated so that they're viewpoint neutral. And then I think beyond that, the market will work it out. Because I don't think people like this stuff. And I think there is enough competition to so what's, what's your cause number? a backlash. So I would, well, I mean, in, in terms of it happening, I, I think we're probably approaching a seven. But I don't think that means that we're going to get this dystopia mm -hmm. and that this is our future and that in 20 years we're going to have a Chinese social credit system because I think you're going to see both the political and the consumer will to yep. eradicate it, it within that time frame. So I, I agree with all that. That's why I'm a five, by the way. But let's let's go to Maddie. Uh, so yeah, I would I would probably be an eight. Um, think we're definitely oh, oh MVD, we're gotta up your game. <laughs> You'll give a more populous seven in a minute. Yeah. Well, <laughs> when, when Charlie's already agreeing with me on the banks, you know, I'm, I feel more confident. You know? um, a I year from now, Charlie would be with you favoring nationalizing the banks, I'm sure. I will not. Um, it's, been, it's been my experience that you really can never, um, you can never underestimate the, the desire of most people to live a quiet life. And so, there has to be a pretty high threshold before people push back on things. I think taking taking your money away and free speech might be that threshold. But um, I, I do think that, as Charlie readily knows, a lot of people don't like this stuff, but they won't say anything, um, not least because the, the social sanctions for being painted as transphobic or homophobic or whatever it is, racist, uh, are so high that they, they will keep it to themselves. They'll mutter under their breath. Um, and unless there's a very clear alternative option, then they'll 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 keep doing it. And if they, if we keep using services and going along with it, then it's just going to get worse and worse. All right. So let's pause for our last sponsor of this episode, Act and Unwind. Inflation spiking gas prices and supply chain disruptions, woke celebs and corporations, as we were just discussing, political cronies and big tech polarization and a culture. In crisis, we know it's hard to stay up to speed with everything that's happening in the world. That's where Acton Unwind comes in. Join experts from the Acton Institute for the Study of Religion and Liberty every Monday as they dissect the latest headlines in an easy to unravel roundtable conversation, chat about politics, religion, and culture through Acton Institute's unique perspective, connecting good intentions with sound economics to promote a free and virtuous society characterized by individual liberty and sustained. By religious principles. To subscribe to Act and Unwind, visit actin.org slash NR or just search Act and Unwind on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. That's actin.org slash NR to subscribe. So, MBD, I got to hustle us along a little bit here. You were predicting, if I'm not mistaken, um, a Tulsi surge in the Democratic primaries in 2020 that that never quite happened. But now we can look forward perhaps to the day when you can predict a Tulsi surge in the Republican primaries in 2024. Exit question to you. Tulsi Gabbard has a future in the Republican Party. Yes or no? Um, not in the Republican Party as an elected official, I don't think. Uh, but in the Republican ecosystem, yeah, I think she does. Um, I think, uh, you know, she was out there as 
a bit of a turf before it was popular, um, uh, particularly among anyone identified on the center left or the left. And um, I don't know, there's something weird and magnetic about her uh, that, yeah. Of course What's that, Michael? Uh, well, for, I mean, <laughs> she, she's, explain she's, more. She's, she's freaking gorgeous. I mean, like, <laughs> like, duh, she's freaking gorgeous. And she puts out all this material on social media that her <laughs> husband films. And he like, this is sounding uh, worse by the minute. Yeah, Michael, stop. stop, stop right there. All right. No, 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 no. no. But it, anyway, she, um, I, I just know that a lot of people, I, in my life, I guess, that are not uh, religious conservatives, but they're skeptical of woke stuff. They follow her on social media platforms where she kind of promotes healthy living and, and a lot of like normal, decent stuff. And she actually seems to like her country, which we can't say for a lot of the left and even some of the populist right, I'll admit that. Um, so she has something going for her. Um, you know, if she was on a trajectory in 2011 and 2012, when she was first elected, she, she was being put on a path by her party to be America's Jacinda Adern, right? Like she was going to be this, uh, woman in politics that was going to advance all the way to the top and be a, you know, a presidential contender someday because she was a veteran, because she was a woman of color. She was a Hindu, she, um, uh, you know, she was being taken seriously by AEI at the time as a, as a major figure. And then she deliberately made choices to undermine that future for herself and to do something different. Maybe other people find it self-destructive, but I think there was a little bit of integrity involved. There you go, Maddie Kern. So we have a vote for not, not an electoral future, but uh, definitely a future in the broader ecosystem. Uh, yeah, I'd agree with that. I mean, certainly there are crazier or out there people in the Republican Party than Tulsi Gabbard, but I think her particular uh, brand of politics would, would find it difficult to have um, electoral success there. Um, I agree with with Michael, not just that she's gorgeous, but she is, but there is that magic uh, quality to her. I mean, I disagree with... It sounds better when oh. you say it than when Michael says it. <laughs> Yeah, Wells Fargo will soon be promoting this part of the podcast. <laughs> um, well, actually, Sarah, do you know, have to it's... come up with some Tulsi Gabbard related title for do this you... podcast. Just fair warning. <laughs> it is. It is actually interesting. If, if it's quite a talent to be able to you know, be a, a, a attractive woman with with presence and get both men and women to like you. And I, I think I think she does that. Obviously, the trans thing helps enormously because she's very uncompromising on that which is you know, one, one reason I'm I'm sympathetic to her but she certainly says a lot of things I strongly disagree with uh, <clears throat> but I find I find her interesting and, and it's kind of what Michael said before um, in an earlier segment about people can overestimate ideology uh, personality counts for a lot and I think she does have that star quality all right so Charlie we, we have some gushing you know Matt, Maddie qualified <laughs> it a little more than MBD but we have some gushing about Tulsi Gabbard. Are you going to join in? No, I think Republican voters should be more expensive dates and stop glomming on to anyone who says anything that they like, especially if they couple it with, I used to be a Democrat. And I apply this to Tulsi Gabbard. She is not a conservative. I dare say she's interesting, and I dare say she's pretty, and I'm glad that she's right on some things, but she has a horrendous approach to, say, Bashar al-Assad. She's a gun control zealot, or at least was. She is in favor of banning fossil fuels by the year 2035. There are many, many people out there who are working pretty hard to advance free market and conservative principles. And there's no need for us to elevate her as if she's one of them when she's not. So I don't think she will have a future because I don't think she's a conservative. She's no more of a conservative than Joe Manchin was just because he bucked the party to which he nominally belongs for a while. And I suspect that this star will begin to dim when she 
is discovered to be on the other side of a whole bunch of issues that Republicans actually care about. So I agree with almost everything you said, Charlie, but I'm going with the MBD answer. She, she's not going to have a future in Republican electoral politics. I mean, wh where would she do it, you know, uh, first of all? And then then she has these issue vulnerabilities if, if it ever push came to shove in like a contested primary. But she'll be a massive conservative populist star. People love converts and, and dissidents from the – the left and the Democratic Party, as Michael and and Maddie have expounded, she she has charisma and star power, and she's going to be built up, and so she'll she'll have a, a huge huge uh, moment, and uh, you know be a, a real media phenomenon for the the time being. So let me really quickly pause. Do NR plus plug. Just let me say, please urge you beg you to sign up for NR Plus. I'll skip everything else and just say it's a really important way to support our valuable journalism. So if you think uh, what we do is important and you want to see it keep going, if you're not going to give us a, a donation, which we obviously welcome as well, the best thing you can do is sign up for NR Plus and join tens of thousands of your fellow National Review readers as a member with that. Let's hit a few other things before we go. So MBD, you have been watching Off the Grid with Curtis Stone. That sounds like a completely mainstream, reasonable <laughs> commentary on YouTube or wherever you're finding this. Yeah, so it's a YouTube channel. Curtis Stone is a guy who, I don't know, probably like 12 years ago became like a libertarian. And then very quickly that led him to urban farming and then of course, is, of course like this, all libertarians that no but it was like a very different kind of you know very specific kind of libertarian psychology uh about, so urban like, far farming you're like you're doing it on the roof of your apartment building or like doing it a little plot in like of a, land like a tiny a plot of land or even in, in a basement or a mm -hmm. garage and what, what was he growing this is not food? not pot not just pot. <laughs> the, the actual uh, other other legal crops for sale but he's he's gradually evolved and he's totally like a conspiracy theorist. He's totally like preparing himself for the new world order to descend on him. Uh, but he's set up this off the grid homestead in British Columbia, which is just like hugely impressive. And he generates his own solar energy. He, he like he gets his own water out of the mountain he lives on uh is basically <laughs> he comes like, up with his own conspiracy the theories what happened to the urban farming well i mean he's he's going bigger now he's got he's <laughs> on, a, on, a, on a bigger mission but actually i his whole mindset is actually like the, the conspiracy theories have turned him into this doer and this pot with this hugely positive mindset uh that is actually optimistic about facing down the apocalypse and um inspirational motivational no i think I, I listen i think he's crackers but like in a really inspiring way maybe this is this explains my attraction <laughs> to figures like tulsi gabbard too but he um anyway we need a tulsi gabbard curtis stone ticket anyway check it check it out like this is to me this is what the yeomanry look like in 2022 they're a little bit a uh, little bit crazy, but they they inject life in the American continent with a spirit of dogged independence. Uh, All right. <laughs> so, Maddie Kearns, I don't know how doggedly independent this is on your part, but you are a fan of Trader Joe's cinnamon and apple tea. Is that what it is? I think it's cinnamon and apple. It might be branded as like their full blend or something, but. Uh, yeah, I really hints, hints yeah, it's it's pumpkin and cinnamon and apple. It it, it kind of it tastes like um like a sugar free apple cider. That's kind of that's kind of the vibe. But um I am I'm a notorious tea snob and think that most American tea sucks. No offense. So like, like um, Earl Grey and English <laughs> breakfast are they bad? Well, when made in America, yeah, they just like I mean, they really, just got li like they're, Lipton, where where you put it in over the water, the oh, so much better. Mm. Like you you put it in the um, 
uh, in the hot water and then this like cloud of white stuff just comes out. I don't know what that is, but it's it's not good. In any case, Trader Joe's Faulty does not have this problem. In fact, it's delicious and uh, it's also caffeine free. So you can have as many cups a day as you want, um, which is great. So I have been enjoying that. So Charlie Cook, you've been doing the single dad thing. Yeah, I think about Curtis Stone, except with a microwave. And... <laughs> <laughs> no, my wife's away for four days. Uh, I'm in charge of the kids. I have to do all the things she does, which obviously gives you a great respect uh, for that. Um, but it's also funny seeing it from my kids' perspective, because you know, last night, for example, I made them dinner, and my six-year-old said, well, you can't make dinner. You can't cook. Like, I said, oh, that's how, that's how he sees me. You don't do that. You know, they're just <laughs> sort of astonished by this. It's not that I've never cooked in our house, by the way, or it's that I've never made them dinner before. But they, they've, they're they aware now that I'm the sole person in charge. And they stare at me while I do it, because I think at the back of their minds, they don't really believe I'm going to gonna manage it. But I have thus far, thus far, Good. all is Excellent. well in the cook household. Good luck. Well, I had my worst name understanding ever at a Starbucks. I was at an airport. It's kind of loud. I said my name. I knew the nice girl behind the counter didn't really pick up my name. She repeated it, but I also couldn't hear how she repeated it. I thought it was probably Mitch. I, you know, that that happens a lot. And I, and I don't mind the name Mitch. Uh, some of my best friends are named <laughs> Mitch. And then I ordered coffee cake and uh, a cappuccino. The coffee cake comes out at, for wish. And I was like, oh, my God. Do I really <laughs> look like, you know, someone who's reading at a... Uh, <laughs> um, one of those story hours. And I was like, do, do I try to fix this? Because another thing's coming out. Do I not take the cappuccino when it comes out for wish? But, you know, there's really nothing to do about it. So uh, that was a, it was a, it was a bad start to my, uh, to my travels. With that, it's time for our editor's picks. MBD, what's your pick? Dan McLaughlin's saying regime is bad, except when we say it, uh, which is just skewering of greg Sargent, who said that uh when republicans say regime we're encouraging violence uh dan has the receipts on the trump years and it's pretty delicious maddie kearns so i also have a, a dan mclaughlin pick i liked his uh corner post on tulsi gabbard um i think it's called where tulsi gabbard belongs and he lays out why some republicans slash conservatives are enthusiastic about her departure from did he, inter the... did he interview mbd <laughs> <laughs> well so point number two i have it open in front of me is um personal enthusiasm for a woman who is attractive telegenic and uh <laughs> ruthlessly aggressive in arguments so i guess that would be mbd in there um but it, but he he also includes a, a note of caution uh which i think charlie developed very nicely but it's a, a very worthwhile post Charlie, what's your pick? Jim Garrity, who's noticed that Joe Biden is absent from the uh, campaign trail because he's unpopular and had the great pleasure, honor of having his work essentially copied by another outlet. Axios finally picked up what Jim has been talking about for weeks. It's a bit of a trend with Jim. He does the work, does the work, does the work, and then someone else takes the credit. So my pick is a magazine piece by the great journalist Sebastian Younger called Inside the Shameful Cancellation of Jihad Rehab, which is about uh, how the mob came for a uh, what was set to be a highly successful documentary. So that's it for us. You've been listening to a National View podcast. Any rebroadcast, retransmission, or account of this game without the express written permission of National View magazine is strictly prohibited. This podcast is produced by the incomparable Sarah Shuddy, who makes us sound better than we deserve. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you, Maddie. Thank you, MBD. Thanks to NetChoice, ExpressVPN, and Acton Unwind. And thanks especially to all of you for listening. We're the editors. We'll see you next time.